Every Night is Game Night, episode 42, Themes That Raise Issues, part one. Hey everybody, welcome back to Every Night is Game Night. This is episode 42. Uh, this is Anthony, once again, with Jason. Yo, my peoples, what's up? All right, so we have a special episode this week. We're going to be taking a look at some games that raise issues. Uh, very, in some cases, heavy issues, right, Jason? Yes, heavy, heavy issues. All right. So to help us with that, we've brought on uh, Dr. Patrick Rail. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you for having me. All right. So uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? You are a Unity University. Uh, sorry, you are a university professor at Bodwin College up in New Hampshire. No, Maine. It's actually Maine. Yes. Uh, I'm a, a professor of history and I teach in history and Africana studies at Bowdoin College here in Brunswick, Maine. And I've been doing that for about uh, 23 years now. You also have an excellent blog that people should know about on the BGG page called Ludica. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I've been trying to uh, Combine my history and scholar identity with my game player identity, and that is the uh, the sausage being made in that blog. <laughs> so, like, you're actually a cool professor. So, if anybody catches themselves in Maine and they want to get a a game of something nice and heavy, <laughs> they can hit That's you. That's right. Up. Well, anyone who calls themselves cool can't be cool, but uh, I am ready for <laughs> games. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so um, if you read the Ludica blog, uh, I read it. I got referred uh, to that blog a couple of months ago, and I I just had to have you on the show because um, me and Anthony, we've been talking about ep two episodes like this for a long time uh, where we – there's games with that, you know, obviously most of the games there, you know, pretty light and, you know, whatever the theme isn't that uh, challenging. But there's some games that just really generate a lot of conversation. So we have picked out uh, over the next two episodes, we're going to be talking about four different games. And we've grouped them into, you know, um, themes uh, that they kind of share. So um, these are games that they're not quite games right like when you think of a game you think of like you know fun monopoly and you know light stuff like this is some really heavy stuff we're going to get into and we're going to talk about some challenging questions about that so we are going to structure the episodes a little bit differently just for people to know uh we are going to give you games <laughs> that's what we're all about uh we're a games podcast so we're going to talk about the games we're just going to talk about them as games so if you don't want to hear this difficult conversations difficult themes or whatever listen to the first part of the episode get a sense for if you want to play these games or not and then we're going to clearly transition to talking about some of the controversial themes that are in these board games uh so the first part of this episode we're going to be talking about um really freedom the underground railroad uh and the issue of slavery that raised in board games uh also Comancheria. we're just kind of uh throwing that in there because uh it's also kind of an american theme but you know we're going to talk about that uh if you want to hear about those games uh please stay tuned and then if you want to hear us for the conversation afterwards, please stay tuned for that as well. Cool. So let's go ahead and dive in on these games. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and kick things off here with Comancheria, the rise and fall of the Comanche Empire. Uh, this is the sequel to Navajo Wars. So if you played that, you'll be somewhat familiar with this. The same designer, uh, some of the same systems. Uh, and basically the game is what you'll be doing is taking control of the Comanche Nation and uh, building trade networks with the different colonies and the friendlier tribes, fighting with some of the more hostile tribes, and then defending against the military and cultural attack that inevitably comes. So the game takes place over four historical periods uh, between 1700 and 1875. You can play any combination of these four. So the, the first uh, scenario is just the first 50 years, um, all the way up through the last scenario, uh, which gets a little heavier in terms of thematics. Um, and th it can shorten the game that way. So I think very generously, the box says it takes an hour to do just that first part. I would say two to three, but <laughs> an hour-ish, yeah. um, upwards of six. Uh, and I think that's probably more so like six to eight to do the full 175 years, all four periods. Um, some things can go quicker if you lose, for example, uh, but generally it, it, it can be a little lengthy. The game itself, you're, you're going to start out with one rancheria if you start at the beginning. Um, and the goal of the game is to really... The goal is to match the different um, criteria of the history card. So the first history card, for example, just says um, take control of one territory and have a second rancheria somewhere. Pretty simple. 
other ones get a little more complicated. Um, you have to take over larger parts of the map. You have to basically survive the onslaught of the, uh, the all the, the colonies different spreading out. So depending on which ones you're facing off against. Um, but the actual actions you take to do all this are fairly simple, <laughs> despite the rules. Uh, you will be moving, hunting, raiding, m moving up the culture track, purchasing different cards, and then ideally during the progress phase, using your success to upgrade your Paraibo and Mahamiana, um, using different resources to increase strength, etc. So, and the game breaks that down into different phases. So you have the actions that you take. Um, there's a progress step you can take as an action, and that allows you to kind of upgrade things. And then a passage of time step, which you can manually take or the game will force upon you if you don't manually take it. Um, and during this phase, a lot of things happen. Uh, different tracks reset, your headsmen can die and then reset you know, their values because it's supposed to rec you know, represent the passage of time. Um, and it does a victory check if certain other conditions are made. So it can be dangerous to do the passage of time manually unless you are in a position to win that particular section. As for the AI, uh, and this is a solo only game, so it was designed for solo. So this, the AI is built in automatically. And what it is, is a, there's an enemy instruction display. There's four different columns, one for each direction. And depending on the historical period, it will match those columns up to different um, potential enemies. So the first scenario, you're facing either the Spanish or the Northern tribes. Um, that's about it. Later on, you have other, you know, different colonies coming in, the United States at the end, etc. cetera. Uh, the the way the AI works is you'll roll a die, it'll tell you which row, you'll flip a, one of the chits over, and all these different chits have different actions that the a, the enemy will take against you. And depending on how many AP uh, markers the enemy has, which will happen through a course of different actions you take, they will take actions until they run out of AP. So if you do too much stuff on your turn, you're giving AP to the enemy, they will then be able to do more stuff back to you. Uh, and it can get kind of brutal because... The, the enemies in this game are always going to seem like they get more actions than you. And so you can never really control the board. You're just kind of managing and then hoping that between managing all the different things you have to manage, you can also move towards your um, victory conditions. Some of the other elements here, there's war cards that will determine the movement of the war columns as well as the attacks. Development cards that sometimes have when drawn or when removed conditions as well as um, some that you can purchase and use culture cards that you can purchase for culture points. Um, all these things add different elements and abilities and things you have to deal with. But in the end, you just need to meet the requirement of that history card. Losing can happen in a number of different ways. Uh, there can be a victory check and you have no history or you, you haven't met those requirements. Um, you can run out of culture or military points, which can happen very quickly if you don't manage it carefully, especially if too many settlements get out there um, for one of the other colonies. Uh, and or you could just get wiped off the map completely. Um, any of those things can and will happen. <laughs> <laughs> On the positive side, uh, I found this, the AI once I finally got through the rules to be fairly smooth. Everything flows. It makes sense. Um, the decisions you make impact what happens to you, and you can and will be hit if you risk too much, too fast. Um, so you need you do need to play methodically. Um, it can be played in different lengths, like I said, which I found very nice i didn't feel like i had to stop the game early because i didn't want to play for six to eight hours the first time through um so those different scenarios kind of let you choose how long you want to play and also it kind of matches with the difficulty and uh it's pretty sandboxy in what you do so you get all these tools you can do whatever you want with them in an attempt to reach those goals there's a lot of randomness here because you're pulling those chips out of the cups you're rolling dice so you need to mitigate those different things that can hurt you and hopefully manage everything in a way that will allow you to get to victory. But at the same time, you can snowball very quickly to failure, even if you think you're going to win. So you have to be very careful about that. On the downside, uh, this is pretty difficult to learn. Now, I'm not a war gamer, so the war gamers out there might find it humorous that I had difficulty learning this game. Uh, but it is... It's a little dense. The rulebook is a little dense. Uh, there's a there's a walkthrough which then references the rules. I think it took most of a full day to learn the game, um, and then the second day to kind of just get through it and get to the point where I felt comfortable playing it. It was definitely one of the longer learning sessions I've had in a long time, and I've played plenty of other GMT games, so I don't think you know I'm not coming to this fresh for this type of game. It was just it was pretty dense. Um, the it is a war game in its 
the way it approaches rules. Um, the language used, the complexity, the procedure mapping, all that stuff. If you're not a war gamer, this is going to feel pretty dense. If you are a war gamer, it might feel a little light. Um, the complexity marker on the back of the box is actually kind of low. I disagree with that. But once you get to the actual mechanics, it's not that complicated. It's just getting through everything. It's kind of it's kind of tough. Um, and it, it can also feel a little, you know, intense. Uh, everything you do feels like you're being punished. You know, if you raid too much, uh, you'll get hit back really hard. If you are too slow, then maybe you won't be able to get to the victory condition by the time it comes up. Um, the best way to play seems to be through politics, diplomacy, um, and very careful selection of when to raid. But at the same time, it's not, uh, you have to be, it's very fine balance. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing from, a, from a cons perspective, but it does make it so like all these different actions you have available, several of them are often not a good choice. So, um, you have to understand that going in, you have to feel comfortable playing a game like that where you're kind of waiting and seeing and then reacting um, and trying to mitigate things as much as possible without giving too many AP uh, to the enemy to act. But all in all, I did enjoy it as um, a gaming experience. Uh, the system is very smooth. It, it definitely has a strong historical flavor to it. You definitely feel kind of the things that you're going through, um, the different scenarios, you you know, where your um, rancherias stand as it goes over the course of these different phases um definitely it seems to match up historically with what was happening or at least what's being presented on these cards so i found it a very interesting experience i feel like if it was a little bit shorter a little bit easier to access i'd probably play a little bit more i'm not sure how often it's going to come out because of its length but um it's definitely one of those unique experiences i'm glad um to have enjoyed Cool. Uh, Dr. L, have, are you a war gamer at all? Uh, I've, uh, I've played some of GMT's uh, coin games, and uh, in the old, old days, I played a few heavier games. But um, uh, what Anthony was saying about the, the balance in this is I, I find really uh, I find intriguing, or the, the density or the complexity of this. Um, and and I, uh, my question for Anthony is, is, uh, is that... Uh, density of procedure necessary uh, to have a nice, rich AI, which gives, which makes the solo play experience possible. Yeah, that's that's a good question. And playing through it the first time, I was a hard no on that. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. Once I once I got through it, uh, and it just takes such a long time. And I think that's a hard part of this. Is I think for a lot of people, they're just not going to put the time in to get there. Um, once you get to the point where you know what needs to happen and how it needs to happen, it does flow pretty smoothly. It's just that first play, play and a half, I found myself referencing not only the, the cheat sheet it comes with, but the full rules almost every single turn, just to remember exactly the sequence of things that need to happen. Um, I don't think it's necessary to have all that there, but at the same time, it works pretty well. Um, once, once it finally got to the point where I didn't need to reference it as much, it flowed very smoothly, and it did feel like playing against an opponent. So, which is rare in these AIs, um, with you know, it's something that's more complex than like an Automa deck. So, I don't know. I'm a little torn. Um, having invested the time in it, I want to say yeah, this is amazing. But for other people who maybe are looking at investing that time, I would say you know, it's a lot of work. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm really curious about like the theme integration stuff, like how it handles colonialism, colonialism. But we are going to save that for after the jump, so to speak, uh, where we will just talk about the games first, and then we'll talk about these weightier issues uh, in a little bit. So that was Comancheria, and now we're going to talk about Freedom, the Underground Railroad, uh, which is a game that I believe all of us have played. Is that correct? Yes. Cool. Uh, so yeah, Freedom is actually an older game. Um, this is designed by Brian Mayer and published by Academy Games in 2013. Uh, so like Comancheria, Comancheria, you're taking the perspective of the Comanche Empire and, uh, the so-called white folk or, you know, the enemy, right? Um, this is, this puts you in the same, uh, position vis-a-vis -vis, like you are, you taking the position of abolitionists. Now the abolitionists were, you know, of mixed races, there was white and black, but you're definitely going up against uh, slave catchers, which were, you know, uh, handled by, you know, quote unquote, white folk. 
uh, Southern white folk, especially because you started um, in the game. You're going to be starting. Uh, actually, let me, I'll take a step back. So what you do is you're taking on the role of the abolitionist and you're trying to guide slaves from the Southern United States through the Northern United States and into their freedom and into uh, their freedom, which is represented by Canada in the in the on the board. The board looks like a pandemic board with different spots and lines connecting them. And uh, the slaves are represented by unpainted wooden cubes, a uh, very specific design choice made by the designer to encourage, you know, it's a weighty theme, obviously, you know, freeing slaves and all that kind of thing. So he wanted to be as abstract as he wanted to. So he represented it by wooden cubes. Um, so what you're, what's happening in the game is that the board will move. And, uh, and on certain spaces in the board, there is a slave catcher pawn. And the slave catcher kind of moves around. Uh, first, you roll a dice to move him around. And then he moves in response to the slave movement. So if you can imagine all of the cubes kind of moving on these tracks and each player kind of has um, ways to move slaves to get into that in a second, the slave catcher will respond to that movement. And it's possible that they, can, if they catch the slaves, they'll be put on boats. And, you know, it's kind of a dramatic thing that happens. Um, so you are so that so they're going to be moving around. They're creating attention. Uh, and then how the players respond is there's a market phase. So in the market phase, you're going to be basically buying the actions that you can do. You don't really have a set amount of actions. You basically can do whatever you can buy from the market. So it's a little bit different from a pandemic type that way. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the actions you can do are basically like either movement or fundraising. So for movement, you get these markers. You can move uh, two cubes, uh, two spaces, or one cube, three spaces, or four spaces, depending on what phase you're in. So there's three phases in the game. The actions get a little bit more powerful as you go, but so does <laughs> the tension kind of ramps up. So it's very like pandemic that way. Um, then you go into the actual phase itself, the actual uh, game where you're implementing those movements. So like I said before, you're moving uh, the pawns, and it's really important to note, I'm going to get back to this in a second as well, you don't have an individual player piece on the board. You just have your abolitionist. Your abolitionist has a special power, which you can use. It has a, either a passive power or a power that you can flip over, which is like a, a powerful one-time effect. You can use that. You can use your, um, your the actions that you've bought. And that's basically it. You kind of go around the table. You take one action at a time, and you're... It's it's very puzzly, very puzzly, because, you know, if you move this slave over here, it's going to move the slave catcher towards you, which is going to create opening on the other side for another slave to move through. So it's very kind of like, you know, uh, how can I, you know, very cat and mouse. That's probably the best way to describe it. So, you know, uh, I'm going to go here, move this opposition here so that another person can go through. And that's going to be your turn. And you do that uh, through three ages. And along the way, you're trying to raise money. You're trying to buy these support tokens. These tokens don't really do anything. They're just like markers that keep you moving through the game. Um, and they represent like, you know, the growing support for the um, the abolitionist movement. So once you get enough of these support tokens, you get enough uh, slaves to freedom, you win. Yay. Uh, losing uh, is happens in a lot of ways. Uh, if you, the slaves will come in in boats. So like every, at the end of every round, more slaves will come in and they'll fill in the bottom plantation spots. If you if you can't fill those plantation spots, the slaves are quote unquote lost. If you get too many lost slaves, you lose the game. Uh, you also lose the game if you can't make it past eight rounds. Uh, so there's only eight rounds in the game, which is sounds like not a lot, but it is. It's enough time. It, what this game takes about an hour or so. As a game, and we'll just talk about it as a game for a second. It's really really tense. I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed the cat and mouse of it. As a solo, you, there is integrated solo rules in the game where you can play with one slave catcher. Uh, so I appreciated that. You don't have to two-hand this game. And it's a really nice kind of tight puzzle, right? Um, cards are very educational. It's, it's you know, uh, you know the, the, there's, there's different power cards that you can also buy in a market phase. They, they depict like Nat's, Nat Turner's Rebellion and, you know, diff, you learn different things like that. Like Anthony was describing about Comancheria, there's different um, things that happen that are a little bit weighty and you kind of, and they're represented by these cards. So that, that, that's here, that's here too. Uh, so I think that, you know, I, uh, that, that part I like, right? Just the tension of it and the puzzle of it. So what did you guys think about in terms of like, you know, uh, responses to the game as a game? You go first, Anthony. 
Yeah, I mean, it's been a little while since I played this, to be honest. But when I originally played it, um, it was hard to divorce the as a game from you know the theme and the actual you know um, subject matter of the game. But as a game, I don't remember being totally blown away. It was a little, um, I don't know. It, it, it wasn't. It didn't really pull me in as much mechanically speaking. And I think the abstract elements of it maybe was part of that, even though I understand why that's been done. Um, I am not a huge co-op guy, though, so I'm not the best guy to ask on that. But at the same time, I do remember liking it more than other people at the table and thinking, um, you know, there's a lot of very interesting things here. The puzzle element of it is, I I like puzzles. So trying to figure that out um, mathematically was always a lot of fun. Uh, But if you're at a table with people who don't necessarily enjoy that as much, it's it's again, not as much fun to play. From a solo perspective, I haven't had a chance to play this solo, and I wish I had, because I think I'd probably enjoy it a lot more. Yeah, it works really, really well. Cause the, I mean, you get, you get fewer uh, slaves that you have to move from the south to the north, and you have the whole board to yourself, basically. Um, my um, criticism of the game, obviously, you know, I, I, I didn't mind the puzzly aspect of it. A lot of people do. Uh, it really is like, you know, one slave goes here, this happens to the board. and It's a very mathematical exercise, which a lot of people were kind of like, eh. Um, then the second thing is, as a multiplayer experience, it, this game is a really bad alpha gamer problem. Probably worse than Pandemic, which I know. Like, what? That game invented alpha player. But this one, <laughs> it's worse because you don't have your own player piece. And people are playing a, the exact same game as you are so like when you're in pandemic and you're, you, you're you're moving your own piece then you're moving your own piece like you're working together but at least you have your own thing and it's almost like a, ta- a table faux pas if you reach over to the other person's piece and you move it for them they're like no 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 no, no don't, not cool dude you don't you don't even have that barrier here in freedom it's just everybody's playing the exact same game so it's just the person who the best at puzzles will very likely take this game over which is kind of crappy so if you don't have that in your group or if you're playing this as a solo, where there is no alpha gamer, you are the alpha gamer, then you know those problems kind of disappear. So those are my only two issues with it. So Dr. Rail, you're definitely you've definitely had a lot of experience with this game. What do you think? You know, for the few times I played this, that penny never dropped. That you don't really have an avatar that's on the board anywhere in this game, and uh, you have this sort of omniscient perspective over everything. That's uh, I think that's interesting. Um, I think I agree with everything that you guys have said. The um, alpha player issue is uh, was there for us. Um, it is very puzzly, um, and so the the puzzle guy in our game group. Um, I don't think we would have won were it not for him and his particular uh, abilities. Um, but I saw it as kind of a step up in the co-op genre. I thought that um, it does some interesting things that, you know, p- Pandemic sets the table and now some other games are wrinkling that formula. Um, I love the historical theme, of course, and the way it's integrated here, I think makes an enormous amount of sense. Um, th- there's There are some games that are just beautifully themed for cooperative play, and this is really one of them. Um, so I think uh, there are a lot of great things going for this game. Um, it might be a little dry for those who don't prefer puzzles. Um, I, I think the, the weakest part mechanically for me must be the fundraising tokens, which feel like kind of an artificial way of getting to victory. Um, I think they can integrate into the theme, but they feel a little bit like we're being directed to do something that um, we wouldn't organically do. Right. So mm-hmm. like the way the fundraising tokens work, I'm sorry to cut you off. Just want to uh, mm-hmm. let people know how they work is that in the first part of the game, you get you play your fundraising token and you get funds depending on how many slaves are in the southern part. And then the next part of the game, you get funds based on how many slaves are on the northern part. So you're making these weird decisions like I, I could bring these slaves to freedom, but I need to keep them in South Carolina so that I can raise money. Which is like... <laughs> Which is a weird choice. Yeah, but you know, and that's interesting though. It it does create these uh, these really tense moments uh, where you have to make these uh, terrible decisions about where you're going to focus. And um, it sounds like Comancheria in a lot of ways, you simply can't do everything you want to do, so you're going to have to give something up, and that's part of the game. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so it, it, that was a little bit of a theme rub. But for the most part, I mean, I, I recommend this game. Uh, as like you were saying, uh, it does some different wrinkles on Pandemic. I really recommend it as a solo. I really think this game plays best with one. Uh, per, per, you know, So that way you take that puzzle person out of the question and you can just kind of sit there and enjoy it and puzzle it all out. So um, if you guys were interested in uh, freedom as a game, I think that's kind of where we all land. Um, so I, so now uh, this was a little bit of an artificial discussion because it's hard to talk about this game without talking about the theme. Uh, but I did want to try this format just to um, for gamers who who want to keep their games as games. Uh, you know, there you go. Uh, information about two you know really good games. Anthony gives a good recommendation for commentary if you're into those heavy war games. Uh, in general, I think we all like freedom, although we do acknowledge its issues. So we're going to talk about some of the difficult themes in these games. So here we go. Um, and this is where I wanted to start. Uh, and I'm going to throw you a little bit of catnip here, Dr. Rob. I think I know what your answer is going to be, but let's start you off with a softball. What, a, what do you think about the idea that games should be games, which means they should be fun? If a right. game has a difficult theme, it's not fun. So I don't, so, you know, uh, someone will say, I don't want to play a game with these type of themes. I don't think games should address these themes. So what do you think about that? Yeah, so you're talking about themes that that uh, uh, that might influence uh, whether a player wants to play or, or does not want to play. Yeah, I, I think that everyone has a different set of thresholds for these things. Um, and sometimes it's based on personal experience or it's based on what you've learned or some aspect of your identity. Uh, so that uh, what is completely trivial for one player might not be trivial at all for another player. And I think those are just about our, our individual thresholds. And what's happened with the gaming community is it has grown so big and there have been so many games, so much product and so many players out there now that um, I think that it's creating some moments of tension that were maybe not as strong when the community of gamers was uh, a lot smaller and perhaps a lot less diverse. Mm -hmm. So in this game, of course, is one that is going to raise a lot of questions. Um, there are, are, of course, a lot of history themed, historically themed games incorporate uh, some aspect of historical slavery, and people tend to react to those in a variety of ways. You can scour the forums on Board Game Geek for through games like um, Endeavor or Colonial or other games that depict slavery. Five Tribes, of course, was Days of Wonders famous. Mm -hmm. uh, they had that slave card in there. Oh, and we'll get to that one. Don't worry, don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> I figured it would be coming, but it's just kind of amazing to see the the, the remarkable array of opinion about uh, about this issue. There are gamers who just could not care less about it and say it's only a game, and there are people who think that that this is really um, an issue. Um, personally, I think that the it's only a game argument um, doesn't really hold up because games aren't only games, they're pieces of our culture, they're pieces of our popular culture, and the way we uh, consume them reflects our values. So um, uh, however we land, I don't think that we can plausibly say that these are only games and don't deserve more serious consideration. Mm -hmm. I, I wanna definitely get that kind of games are not only games thing and let that kind of hang there for a little bit. Um, Anthony, let's get back to Comancheria. You you kind of talked about the game representing colonialism, and then the last phase of the game gets a little weighty. Do you want to kind of say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, early in the game, it's it's not super aggressive. I mean, your Rancheria, your bands will go and you know they'll raid other tribes. Um, the West, the Spanish will uh, you know remove other tribes, kind of on the other side of the board, not your tribes, and then build settlements, but that's about as much as what happens. Later in the game, obviously, there's a lot more interaction um, because you not only have the Spanish, you have the Americans, they've entered the, the board as well. And this big circular reservation space at the top of the board comes into play and then some of your stuff can start to go there. Um, and so the interactions become less about kind of carving out a space, you know, and building this Comanche empire and, and more about survival, you know, um, trying to integrate, but at the same time not be completely subsumed. So, and that's the interesting thing I found about this game was 
it's not just about fighting. It's, it's back. It's not, it's not even primarily about fighting, even though that's the thing that you worry about the most. It's about, you know, culture, you know, these culture tokens that come up can, you can lose that way. Um, and just be being kind of absorbed. Uh, and it's, it's, it's interesting. And it, it goes from just being this kind of puzzle where I'm trying to work out what to do and how to carve out the space to being like, Oh, okay. <laughs> like, you know, these things, they, they do jump out at you and you have, you do have to think about them in a way that you wouldn't necessarily in a game that wasn't so, um, deeply thematic. I think that that's kind of where I want my opinion of freedom and that in a way, like the, a game is a game and a game is a puzzle and whatever, um, all that stuff. But like the, the, the culture issues that it triggers for you, can really take a game and bring it to that next level of, okay, I'm learning now, or I'm seeing things from a different perspective now. You know, like a game like Comancheria or Navajo Wars before it uh, had a very unique perspective. Not a lot of games had um, presented that Indian perspective and not like, you know, like that, that, that romantic Indian perspective, like Pocahontas or, you know, um, John Smith or all that stuff. But like, you know, um, and not like the glorious, you know, conquering people either. It's about survival and freedom. It literally is, you know, winning is not losing all of your slaves, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and they abstract that out. But they really like if you read the rule book for freedom, it's heavy. Like, you know, you read it and it's like the slave catchers go here and you're moving your slaves here and slave, 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 slave. It really hits you over the head what you're doing. It's just it's a really weighty thing for me. As much as I may kind of like, you know, give a maybe a, a half thumb or whatever it is as a game to freedom, I think it's a really important game. And I think games like Commentria or I think Spirit Islands, another one that's coming down the pike, they're really important. And why are they important? Um, Dr. Rail, you have this quote that I love in one of your um, Ludica blogs. You were saying, you said, games have never been only games, they do important cultural work. We buy games precisely because they perform powerful psychic and social functions for us. So can I ask you to elaborate a little bit on the psychic and social functions you're talking about? Sure. Um, I think the games, particularly heavily themed games, um, ask us to step into different worlds. That's the game's metaphor, right? Who do you play in this game? Who do you represent? What is the situation you find yourself in? That's the kind of uh, the, the release, the escapism that, that, that games offer. And generally that's, that's fine. Um, sometimes that play is more exciting when you have more at stake. And so your identity with that, with whatever themes you're talking about can become, um, important. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's awesome to play the allies and access and allies and completely whoop up on the axis powers. You know, and there are people who will persistently only play certain powers because they identify with them in certain ways. Freedom, um, Comancheria, some of these other games are interesting because the metaphor that they offer players is is uh, one that associates players with oppressed people, people who we would normally think of as historical uh, losers of of powers you know, contests of power. So, and these are, it's not, it's not usual to uh, uh, have a game where you represent a slave. It's particularly not usual to have a game where you represent a slave and you're trying to do good things. And it happens to be a mechanically very good game, perhaps mm -hmm. not perfect, but it's freedom can stand on its own regardless of its theme. But here you're being asked to do something that very few people would uh, uh, mind doing, which is to help enslaved people become free. Uh, that's not what other games that incorporate slavery ask players to do. If you play some games, you will be you will essentially be be asked to become a user of slaves. That's a little bit more difficult. So I agree with you, uh, Jason. I think that this is that both these games are enormously important because they create these precedents for different ways of driving a game's metaphor, different ways of identifying yourself uh, with the game. Um, in in some of the sometimes on Board Game Geek, you'll see in the forum somebody will have a concern about slavery and and well, I I will not play a game 
that has slavery in it, or I will not play a game uh, that has um, uh, Nazis in it. And I, I don't think the question is, is uh, it, the question is how a game incorporates these elements, not whether it incorporates these elements. Uh, because a game is just a system of incentives, you can create those incentives to favor any position within the game that you want. What's novel about Freedom and Comenteria and some of these others is that they are incentivizing you to identify with and help um, people who are historically oppressed. That's very interesting. Yeah, and like I think it's really important because I like what you said about escapism, but not like the bad escapism, like uh, you know, flights of fancy and you know, escaping reality, but like that's how we grow, right? Like kids play. And why, like, what do kids do? Kids play doctor. Kids, you know, you get little kitchen sets. So you get, you know, mm-hmm. are like superheroes. Like they, they, kids need that, right? In order, like, if you appropriate that other identity and you come back to yourself, you're like a better person. You, they say walk a mile in a man's shoes. Well, imaginary shoes count. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but the uh, thing about this as play is that there's always a kind of dangerous element to it, which is what makes it interesting. So, uh, we don't play games that are that are boring and non-challenging because they don't ask us to stake anything. So um, I, I agree. We're we're playing all the time, homo ludens, right? We are people who play. Um, but there are are, uh, are are times when clearly games ask us to take on roles that are troublesome, if not outright objectionable. So there are games like Grand Theft Auto is the classic in the video game world. Um, there are a couple other. Uh, really nasty kind of video games that uh, uh, ask you to slaughter Muslims and do all kinds of other terrible sorts of things. So games games can drive us to identify with the historically oppressed, or they can simply reinforce uh, all of our biases and prejudices. Yeah, and I think what you said before about, like, if you're going to have a game representing oppressed peoples, it better be good. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you know? right. uh, like, a game, like, you could get a game that represents oppressed people, but it really stinks. And that's where the politically correct thing comes in. So mm. that, that's something that you hear a lot, right? Like, oh, this politically correct, and no, no, no. You know, uh, you can't cr- uh, criticize Grand Theft Auto. It's politically correct to do so. So I think what they're saying is, in a way, it's like code for don't make my experience lame, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't make yeah. my experience I, sucky I, and boring, like make my experience like, you know, we need good games in order to be able to really represent these, you know, um, oppressed peoples as you put them, you know, and that that's how we get the change. And that, that we're not just doing this for the sake of it. They yeah. need to be good. Well, and that's what's so remarkable about freedom, right? So there are other games that represent this experience. There are online games. National Geographic has one that's, and the the the, the basic metaphor is pretty familiar. It, you know, it's a, enslaved people in the south, a network of of lines to get them to the north. We've seen images and diagrams of the Underground Railroad in textbooks and whatnot. So that notion, I don't think, was enormously uh, original. What was uh, remarkable about freedom is that gamers can play it and enjoy it and appreciate it. That, as you say, uh, Jason, it is a good game simply in game terms. And I think that uh, that's what what sets it apart. It creates a, um, uh, a target for other games to reach to. So let's talk about, so, okay, I think we're both, we're all in agreement. Like we like these games, we, we want them to be good. And I think they're not just that we like them and we think it's nice to represent oppressed people. Like uh, we think it's important. I think it's important as our, for our growth as human beings. It's important as to kind of grow our, our cultural space, you know, so it's not just the same perspective all the time. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's talk about, you know, some of these games that have that pers- or that cluster of perspective. You don't want to ever say, you know, the imperialist perspective. I think it is multiple. You know, uh, that's that's also multiple. I don't want to demonize those games. Uh, and I don't want to pick on you, Anthony. <laughs> but unfortunately, a lot of Euro games have they put you in that space, that headspace of uh, mercantilist you know, or a, um, you know, a, a person who's going out and conquering a lot of space, you know, they get that area control or whatever it is. Um, it, like, what is your reaction to that? Like, are you, 
conscious of it or is it like it's so mechanically driven that the theme doesn't really matter like how do you interact with when like you know something like slavery or colonialism is present in a game but not quite because of mechanical things going on yeah it's a good question i think most of the time i'm not really thinking about it because most euros are pretty dry (laughs) and it, it just becomes a mechanical exercise but there are situations in which that comes up i mean five tribes was a little uncomfortable at first edition and i you know I, I i didn't really like how that was implemented for example um puerto rico is another one where i've played it and enjoyed the game but been you know uncomfortable with how it in- integrated some of those um components so i'm sure there's plenty of other euro games i've played where i didn't even realize that's what we were doing uh you know the little cubes it didn't really click like what the cube represented uh, I'm not a theme guy, so sometimes I miss these things. But when it does click through, when it does, when it's integrated in such a way or presented in your face enough that you realize, you know, what the situation is or what you're kind of replicating, it's not that I don't want to do it. It's just I want it to be reflective of the, I guess, kind of what we know about um, those times now. And it's not always the case. I think it's usually just slapped on there by the designer. Because that's what things were like, and they just they want to kind of be all encompassing um, for their own theme, even though it's kind of weak. Uh, yeah, I I can't say I can easily defend Euro theming, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> this is also a conversation we've had before, and uh, I'm okay with that. Uh, yeah, yeah. But- I mean, and it, it represents a perspective, and it, it, I it, I don't want to say I discount that perspective because it happened. They drove history. You know, we it is what it is. It's just a question of like multiple perspectives right or, or do we have good solid solid games on representing different perspectives you know yeah definitely and i think that's important uh and I, it, it has definitely come up so games like like you mentioned spirit island earlier i'm very excited that that's coming out because that is the other perspective that you never ever see in that type of game so that'll be interesting um you know yes at a more what accessible it, yeah. level not necessarily these big epic war games that take eight hours to play uh, when you've been a, pl- a game player for a long time, uh, Dr. Uh, you, uh, Puerto Rico came out when? In 2002? Oh, that was 90s, I thought. But uh, we can figure that out quickly with the help of old Google. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Actually, I think yeah. it was released in America in 2002, and then there was it was a game before that. Something, something uh, like that. Right. Um, uh, so you, you, you? Absolutely right here. Uh, yeah, but I mean, I, what's interesting uh, to me about the history of this is is that uh, uh, you know the, the the Euro games came out, and part of their appeal was that uh, there was less direct confrontation, no player elimination, um, that the bits were a lot friendlier than say the old SPI, you know, war game kind of bits. Um, these were family experiences, and. So they, they shied away from war, which also makes sense from this coming out of post-war Germany. You know, these were themes they particularly shied away from in games. And in, instead, in offering these family experiences, they hearken back to certain themes that must have seemed sort of safe and nostalgic. You know, um, was, you know moving boats across oceans and building economies or, uh, you know, building cathedrals and, and towns and this kind of stuff. And 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 that does seem a lot safer than you know the Eastern Front in World War II, um, but because of the sort of historical nostalgia built into them, it also they also had these blinders on that sort of suppressed or missed some uh, aspects of history. Of yeah. course, the job was never to present history. These weren't really educational, meant to be educational at all. They were just largely. These are Euro games. They were, you know, skins for abstracts mostly. And unfortunately, because they borrowed from history, you're importing some difficult stuff, you know. And they, um, so I, I think I take Puerto Rico. Um, I know it, it, there's so many BGD threads about it, you know. And I, I don't want to beat a de- dead horse. I, I really don't. But I was really kind of disturbed when I heard a recent episode of the Dice Tower. They did a look back to 2002, the game, the best games of 2002. Half the contributors said Puerto Rico. None of them mentioned that you have the quote unquote colonists that are coming over on boats and being put to work in fields and factories. 
And, <laughs> and are represented by little brown cubes. Little yeah. brown cubes for crying out loud. I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm Puerto Rican. I don't know if uh, people know that. And my last name is Perez. I, th- this is something that, you know, that the instant that game hit the table and this, I, I, I'm not a old gamer at all. I've been tabletop gaming, a board gaming for maybe uh, five, six years. When I first saw Puerto Rico, I'm like, what is this? Mm-hmm. I immediately mm-hmm. saw it, and uh, the rest of the table, which happened to be, you know, uh, you know, a Caucasian American, they're looking at us like, oh, "What's the problem?" It's like, yeah. there's there's brown people being put in the fields, you know, mm-hmm. and like I don't, so I so I I just want to point that out, and I also kind of want to highlight what if, like you were saying before, how uh, they tried to represent the game in a way that was like abstracted from the theme um, yeah. because of whatever, but what if? They introduced a mechanism where during the production phase, instead of just it happening like right away, you roll the die. And on a six, you lost the crop and the worker. Mm, mm, right, right. Or there was oh. some pr- provision for having the, the workers actually revolt or get upset with you. It would be a great catch the leader mechanic, right? If you're oppressing them too much and getting too much work out of them, maybe they revolt. Or you have to pay them. You can't just save up your money and buy a war. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, some like, some games incorporate this um, uh, colonial uh, Europe's empires overseas. I think that's what it's called. Um, has a provision where uh, you can early on take over parts of the globe that produce slaves, which are a commodity like any other. But then once uh, one player reaches a certain economy level, abolitionism happens and the slaveholding player is actually punished for having slaves. I think Endeavor does the same thing. In Archipelago, there's a moment where if you have too many um, upset workers, they will, they will revolt and create political independence for uh, your economy and you'll lose actual areas uh, and lose the game. Um, so there, it is possible to incorporate slavery in more complex ways than Puerto Rico. Yeah, and and I guess the maybe that the point of this um, this whole episode is to kind of encourage that, you know, like not to just you know bash, which you know Puerto Rico is a great game. Like it's it's very important in the history of games that Puerto Rico was there because it's inspired so much further stuff. We just want to kind of problematize a part of it. Because as Dr. Rare was saying, there's a historical reason why the theme is there. They specific that the the Germans, when they were developing games, they specifically thought out sought out these kind of benign building type themes because post-war Germany was rebuilding. So that's what the games were all about. But then it introduces the problematic elements that, and I'm glad that there's more, you know, I'm not I'm not seeing a deluge. <laughs> yeah. But I'm glad yeah. there's more kind of attention to it. Um I did want to uh, before we I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, it's just interesting that, that sometimes those historical scenarios, um, games with historical scenarios where players are trying to uh, take on the roles of oppressed people, they're, they're, in traditional terms, they're kind of hard to represent because uh, the oppressed people are the losers in these power contests. So the Comanche Act, you know, ultimately wiped out. Um, lots of slaves actually died, and there was only one successful slave rebellion in world history, which is the Haitian Rebellion, or at least in modern world history. So it's very hard, you know, when you first think about what a game is, you're, it's, it's hard because these are powerless players, and you have to, uh, who don't usually win by traditional terms. So you have to use the mechanics of these systems to, um, to create uh, systems where where by some measure they actually have a chance of winning, um, even if it's not a historical win in game terms, it can be considered a win. Yeah. So uh, before we uh, kind of wrap up wrap this conversation, I did want to get back to the issue of five tribes that you mentioned, Anthony. I do. Um, I do remember. I don't know if I. Um, I, I don't think we were talking at that point, but I do remember you mentioning something on BGA about being uncomfortable with the whole slave card and everything. Uh, I remember reading the Days of Wonder response because they did uh, put out a res- their response, like defending the addition of the slave card. Basically, they said that they were trying to make a game that evoked not necessarily ancient Arabia, but specifically at, um, the Shahrazad tales, the thousand and one. Um, a, a, a thousand one nights. I forget. I forget exactly what the um, title is. Um, so in that series of books, you had slaves that were 
specifically called slaves and they did you know there was complicated like they did wondrous things they you know sometimes it was like the virtuous slave uh doing stuff so that's they were trying in making five tribes they were trying to recreate that particular world that's what that card represented was the good slave or whatever it is uh and you know they had that backing of like oh here it is in this in a historical text why can't we have it in our game so uh (laughs) i don't know if you saw that at the time anthony or if you bought that at all yeah, I mean, it's, it's easy to say that from, like, a backstory perspective, but when you're playing the game, you just have a card, there's no text on it, there's just slave cards, and they're in the market. Like, I don't, I, you know, you don't know how else to take right. that. Um, in context, it makes some sense, and if you have all of that information, as the developers and designers did, then it's easy to look at it and be like, well, okay, well, this is part of a whole overarching story, and this is what this is about. But Five Tribes is still... A semi-abstract Euro game. There's not a ton of theme imbued to the game. It's a beautiful game, but those things are not written out. You don't have flavor text. You don't have a big backstory in the book. You don't have characters on the board. Um, so I, I, it's not that I don't believe them. I just don't think it necessarily uh, works in this particular context because of the fact that, uh, yeah, again, you have slave cards in the market. Yeah, so they, the game didn't do enough, basically. Like, it picked that, and I, that's kind of my point when it comes to these defenses. Like, oh, it was he- it accurate to the times, because therefore we should do it now. I, I think that's you're, – you're always picking and choosing, right? Um, <laughs> lots of things were accurate to that time. Like, you know, if you go back to 1001 Nights, there was pe- penis castration. <laughs> do you want to have that in your game? <laughs> and there was a lot of stuff in the game, you know? So it's almost like I kind of equate it to forging a signature. Like, if you forge – like. Uh, you know, I was a kid. I forged my parents' signature when I was <laughs> when I needed to sign a <laughs> test or something. It's gonna look like my signature. And even if I practice for years and years and years and make it close to my parents' signature, there's always gonna I'm always gonna have a little bit of stuff that I put into that thing to make it hmm. mine, right? So I think like that defense of like, oh, it's accurate to the times. Oh, there were workers in Puerto Rico. Oh, there were slaves in the market or whatever. However, it works in five tribes. It's it always has our stamp on it, which makes it problematic, and which makes you have to have that extra level of caution when you do that. Yeah, I think the the problem with the slave card and five tribes for some people was simply that it existed, right? So some people objected to the fact that any representation of something historically horrible like slavery being in the game um, that was one the you know perhaps the highest level of of uh, rejection. Um, but some people didn't like it because of what the slave card did. Uh, and the fact that it is posed in the game as simply uh, things, you don't identify with that character in any way. You certainly don't protect it or help it in any way. So it's, it's, it's merely an object to be used. And I think regardless of its historical accuracy, that's what some people had a, had a problem with. Um, many, many things can be represented in games, but as your uh, wonderful castration analogy shows, that doesn't mean they should be. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, we, that was a really <laughs> – we covered a lot of ground there, and I, I think I um, I have a little like outline over here. And I think we hit basically all the important points. Is there uh, something else you wanted to touch on in terms of uh, you know, uh, this particular theme in board games? We'll have more to say about difficult themes in the next episode, but in terms of like slavery and colonialism and you know well, these I, types I, of things. I, I'm fascinated by um, the educational potential of these games. And not by, when I say that, I don't mean like this sort of lame, horrible educational games that we're talking about. I'm, I'm curious about whether these games can, um, can actually teach a kind of useful history um, through their mechanics. You know, so we're, what are you asking players procedurally to actually do? What roles are you asking them to take on? Uh, and is it, is it, if games can, make uh can reinforce problems of stereotype and prejudice then um how do we make sure that um the alternate is possible as well right 
And like, um, I know that we may be dredging up some old stuff. Puerto Rico is an older game that they took out the slave card. So there's a kind of a quote unquote happy ending for five tribes. I, but I think it's still important because I just have a feeling that it's going to keep happening. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's it, maybe those games kind of resolve their issues, but there will be more. Uh, <laughs> so. but, but we all, you know, we'll have more freedoms, more commentary is we'll have, um, I think people will get bolder about trying to take on historical topics that, uh, um, are, are challenging and take them on in, in thoughtful ways. And I think it's really important that they do so. It's not just like, it, I don't think it's, it's, be, it's more than just nice. I think it's important for us in terms of growing our own culture as a gamer community, uh, in terms of growing our inc inclusivity. Like I saw that a bunch of podcasts had kind of gotten together and, you know, with the point of like, you know, being more inclusive. Mm -hmm. Part of that is, like putting the feet to the fire to these designers and publishers to make good games that enable people to play in their space and through that play, learn and grow about different perspectives. Like you can be told, be be more inclusive to your blue in the face and anybody parent, <laughs> me and Anthony are parents and you are too, Dr. Rail, you tell somebody to their blue in the face and it's like, does it just kind of rolls off? But if they play with it, if they... Yes they will then the learning happens so that that's, is the that's, hope. that is the hope yeah. so uh yeah i think i'm good anthony you have anything else that uh that you want to talk about in terms of these this uh discussion no no i think that's gonna go ahead and wrap up this week's episode uh so we're gonna be back next week with um dr rail again to be talking about more uh difficult themes in gaming so um that's not everything for this topic guys we'll be back with a couple new games next week cool all right. Uh, well, thank you very much, Dr. Um, Dr. Rao. This was really awesome. We're looking forward to next week. Thank you. That was a fun conversation. So next Monday night? That's right. All right. I'll be there. All right, guys. That's going to go ahead and be everything for this week's episode of Every Night is Game Night. Uh, Guys, if you haven't had a chance yet, check us out on Facebook. The Board Gamers Anonymous page is growing rapidly. I'm um, having some great conversations there with a lot of you, as well as the uh, Board Gamers Anonymous listeners. You can catch us on Twitter at ENGN underscore podcast. Also have the guild on Board Game Geek 1735. If you have not yet, check out BoardGamersAnonymous.com. You'll find all of these episodes and the show notes for everything, including this interview. Uh, and, you know, if you haven't had a chance yet, we'd really appreciate it. Stop on by, leave a quick review on iTunes. Five stars goes a long way, helps more people find the podcast, um, shows us that you're listening, but also helps introduce solo games to more people. So that's going to go ahead and be everything for this week. So until next week, grab a solo game off the shelf and let's make every night game night. Later, everybody. Later, everybody.